talking to you about uh, finding overrepresented pathways in gene lists. And this is really, I hate to say it, the theoretical part of this. And then you're going to be doing a practical in about an hour. Uh, the reason we teach you this is because there are, uh, even though for many cases there are tools that do these types of analyses for you, there's always a little bit of a turnover in tools. And often we had people who, uh, uh, came, students who came, and probably there's some students here, whose organisms of interest weren't actually covered by the tools. And they had to figure out how to do this stuff themselves. Uh, also, I mean, I think it would help to understand what the p-values mean that you're getting out of these tools, what a false discovery rate is, and what a Bonferroni correction is, so that you're comfortable with these things because the tools refer to them in different ways and different tools do different subsets of these things. Um, please, if you want, stop me with questions uh, at any time during the talk. I'm very happy to answer uh, people's questions. In fact, I like a little bit of back and forth. So uh, our learning objectives, uh, there's really, there's a big list here. Um, and you can read this in your own time. You can read it now if you want. Um, but really, there's like four things that, that I want you to learn. So in terms of like the basic tests, there's two types of tests. There's tests where you have a list of genes, and you want to find out if any pathways are enriched in that list. right? And then there's another type of test where instead of having a, a discrete list of genes, you have like a whole bunch of genes that are ranked by some score, like differential expression, for example. Um, that's the uh, motivating example that we use. But any way that you have of scoring genes, where you might think that genes at the top of the list or genes at the bottom of the list are special in somehow, these types of tests are, uh, are uh, based on that. And those are for ranked lists of genes. OK, so those are the basic tests. And then there's two types of corrections you can make for multiple tests. Now, everyone's heard about multiple test corrections. And I'm, I suspect a lot of you have heard about the Bonferroni correction or the false discovery rate. And so we're going to talk about what those are and what those corrections mean. And we're even actually going to tell you how to compute those corrections. And it's actually very straightforward. So don't worry about that. I can make it easy. OK, so those are the learning objectives. Right? There's a lot of words on these slides. There's a lot of words on these slides. So you can use them as notes later. OK, so I, I mean, I pretty much outlined everything that I'm going to talk about uh, today. Um, I, I, I love to point, but I can't because there's two screens. So um, maybe I'll try the mouse. Maybe I won't. We'll see how it works. I might walk back and forth. And so the, um, uh, the, the first basic test, and that's the gene list test, is called, um, it's called Fisher's exact test or the hypergeometric test. And that, that's the only one you need to know for a gene list. All the other tests are somehow uh, approximations of this test or work in weird special cases where you, a gene might occur more than once on the, on the list. But basically, if you know Fisher's exact test, you know everything you need to know about uh, looking for a pathway, uh, an over-enrichment of a pathway in a gene list. Now, for the ranked lists, the situation is a little bit more complicated because people can't really agree on what the right test is. And that, that's because the tests ask different questions basically. And so we're going to go over that. And I'm going to talk about two different tests uh, for rank lists. Uh, the GSCA test, uh, which is developed by uh, people who uh, the Broad, and they make this, you know, they make uh, uh, tools that are very popular, the GSCA analysis. And that's one of the tools you're going to use in the integrated assignment. The other test is called the min minimum hypergeometric test. Uh, and this was developed about 10 years ago. And this is the test that's, being, that's, that's used in G-Profiler, which is something else that's going to show up in your, um, in your uh, integrated assignment. And then once, we describe, once I describe those tests, uh, we're going to go into multiple test corrections, as I pointed out before. OK, so as I said, you have two types of enrichment analysis. One is a gene list. Say you're like thresholding expression change above twofold. So you have a list of genes that have uh, changed in your treatment condition or a list of genes that are upregulated in your treatment condition. How you decide where that threshold is just depends upon what you're looking for. And I can't help you too much with that decision. Right? A lot of that just depends on the statistics of like your gene expression or what it is exactly that you're looking for. But I'm going to assume that you have a gene list, and you think that gene list is somehow special, and now you're looking for pathways in that list. OK, and then the question is, are there any of these pathways? And here I've called them gene sets. I'm also going to call them annotations, but let's just use the word pathway, even though you know, 
sometimes you're looking for things that aren't quite pathways. We're just going to use the word pathway so we can distinguish it from gene list because you have two pair, you have two lists that you're comparing to one another. Okay. So the first question is: Are there any pathways surprisingly enriched in my gene set and my gene list? Oh no, here we go. Uh, this always happens to me in this talk. Um, okay, and that's like I said. There's one test for that. And then say you're going to rank genes by differential expression. That's one way to do it. You know, maybe you rank them by uh, you know expression itself or you know number of like um, uh, peptides that you're able to recover from the gene in a mass spec experiment. Uh, and in the rank list, it answers the questions, are any gene sets ranked surprisingly high or low in my list of genes? I hope that's not me. Whose phone is that? Okay. Thanks, Gary. That was good. <laughs> okay. All right. And so there, like I said, there's a bunch of tests. Okay, I feel like I'm belaboring the same point, but here we go. Here's the enrichment test. So the idea is you start with some, let's see if I can get this, uh, there we go. So, good, okay. If I shake it enough, it becomes big, oh, but only for a short while. Okay, so, uh, you know, these are, you know, we've been doing this, oops, we've been doing this for a while. So in the old days, we, everyone used microarrays to measure gene expression, and I think everyone understands what a microarray is at this point in time. So you take your, uh, your microarray and you take your gene, uh, all the genes that are on your microarray and you look at the different conditions um, and then you pass that through some sort of enrichment test based on, oh sorry, you take your microarray, you look at the different conditions and then based on that you come up with your gene list, your set of genes that are acting strangely. And then you take your gene list, put that through a gene uh, enrichment test where you compare it to gene set or pathway databases and then at the end of the day you come up with an enrichment table where each one of the pathways is annotated with some score, and that score is the p-value. And everybody knows you want the p-value to be as low as possible. Okay. All right. So given the gene list, given the pathways, which I'm also going to call gene sets or annotations, and as, as Gary said, there's a lot of different sources of gene annotations these days. The question is, are any of these annotations surprisingly enriched in the gene list? Are there more genes in that pathway than you would expect by random? if that gene list was just randomly selected from the background of all the genes that you're considering in your assay. Okay. If you like proteins, I could say proteins instead. But you have a background of things that you're considering, genes or proteins, microRNAs, who knows, SNPs. And you want, and you want to ask the question, are, uh, you know, I've selected some special list through my experiment, are there any pathways that are enriched in this list? That's what your test is asking. Okay, so uh, I'm quickly talk about where these gene lists might come from, how to assess surprisingly, and that's when we have to do the statistics, and how to correct for repeating the test over and over again. And this correction is important, right? Because you come up with your gene list, and then there's like literally thousands of different pathways you can look for, right? And everybody knows that if you if you run like a p if you compute a p value over and over and over and over and over again, eventually you'll get something that you like. <laughs> Which is great, right? But you don't want to publish that because you're almost certainly going to be wrong. Okay, so there's like the classic two-class design where let's say you have some like untreated and some treated condition and you look at uh, differential expression and then here are, uh, throughout the talk I'm just going to, I'm just going to use this, the shading to go from like high express to low express and then you just threshold that differential expression at some, at some point. And there's a lot of different ways you can choose to threshold that, and there's, there's you know, uh, you know a, a, an entire class on how to choose that threshold. Or you use some sort of differential expression tool that, that will give you a p-value that you can then use for that threshold. But you threshold in some way. You might just look at the uh, genes that are highly expressed, the ones that are lowly expressed, like are down-regulated, up-regulated, or differentially regulated. If you have time course data, uh, one way to come up with gene lists is to cluster the gene expression profiles of each gene across the time course. And then based on that clustering, say like a k-means clustering or some sort of hierarchical clustering, you have different groups of genes. And you can ask, within these different groups, are there certain pathways or annotations that are enriched? OK. And so how does it work? Well, there's the. Uh, 
here's your background. So this little box here represents all the genes under consideration. Right? And then these days, um, it seems like you don't have to worry about the background, but you still kind of do. So uh, in the old days, uh, I used to give, in fact, <laughs> just last year, uh, I, I give a little, uh, I, I give, I can't think of the word uh, in English, which is my only language. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I, give a, like, I, I give a short lecture, let's call it, um, on um, uh, the fact that, you know, if you have a microarray, that just has genes that are expressed in the immune system on it. We used to call this the immune array. And then you choose some gene list from that microarray and you find that it's enriched for immune function. You shouldn't be surprised. Right? So, so you, you, when you're thinking about looking for enrichment, you have to define your background, which is the set of genes under consideration. Like, what, what, what that means is these are the genes that could have come up in your gene list if your assay had gone differently. Okay? And we could talk a little bit uh, during questions about what the right way to find that background is, but that background is very important. Okay? Great. Okay, so there's the background, which is important. Um, okay, so like mass spec, for example, there's some proteins you just can't detect. Right? If you can't detect those proteins, those proteins shouldn't be in your background. If those proteins have never been detected by a mass spec in that cell line of interest that you're looking at, those proteins shouldn't be in your background when you do the analysis. Okay, and so, and then now you have your gene list, which is a special set of these, and you know, you've sorted the genes so your gene list is at the top, but you know, whatever. And, and then your gene set is no, uh, contains an overlap, this little bit, bit of a Venn diagram. So there's some genes in the background that are you're in your gene set, there's some genes in the foreground, in the gene list in your gene set, and there's some genes that live outside your background because they weren't considered in your experiment. Those ones you can ignore. And the question is, is the overlap here surprisingly large given the overlap of this entire thing? Okay. And the way that you measure that is using a p-value. And I'm going to spend a few minutes, or I guess a few seconds later on, explaining exactly what a p-value is. And I know you've heard this over and over and over again, uh, but I think it helps to just say it a few more times. I'll try to make it as, as clear as possible. Okay. And so, I mean, essentially what the p-value computes is the probability that you would see an overlap at least as large if you were just randomly selecting that gene list from the background. And one way you can do that is randomly select a whole bunch of gene lists from the background in the same size and figure out how often you see an overlap at least that large. If you do that, that's called an empirical p-value. And often people do do that. The problem is, is you have to do that selection a lot to get really low p-values, right? Because, you know, it's always going to be 1 plus, divide, plus the number of times you see it above the enrichment divided by the number of selections you do. So if you want a p-value 10 to the minus uh, 6, you have to do this a million times. So luckily, under some conditions, we know what the distribution of overlap should be from random sampling. And in that situation, you can say you can compute the p-value analytically. And the Fisher's exact test is one such example of that. Okay. Okay, so, so here's the recipe for doing the enrichment test. First, you define your gene list and your background, right? Then you, dis you select your gene sets or pathways to test for enrichment. Really, you should select these ahead of time. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to be continually selecting pathways until you find one that you like, right? And that's not, that's not quite kosher. Um, and then you run your enrichment test, correcting for multiple testing if necessary. That means if you have more than one pathway that you're checking, uh, step four, in interpret your enrichments, and step five is published. Great. Yeah? So just make sure that I understand it correctly. So let's say if I build a whole uh, exome sequencing, so my background list should be, I assume, all the genes in whole genome. And the gene list will be like the genes that are mutated. Right, so, uh, so you're doing whole uh, exome sequencing. Yeah, so I mean, you would want to be a little bit more careful in case your like, selection, you're, you know, whatever you're using to do this selection for the exons, 
doesn't capture the entire genome. So like, if I can check, like, how many totally genes that are covered in right. our exam and can use that number as my background list? Yes, that set is your background list. It's not just the number, because you're going to be asking whether or not the genes that weren't mutated mm -hmm. have that annotation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For, for expression data, would you be considering all of the genes above the threshold and those that are below the threshold as your background? So expression data is kind of, uh, it's something I, uh, I struggle with in, with my own analysis. Uh, so it really a it depends on the question that you're asking, right? So if you want to say, um, is there differential, you know, you define your gene list, let's say you take like some sort of, I don't know, let's say you're looking at a cell line, and then you, you do like, you do a knockdown or something, and then you see which genes are differentially regulated. Right. Well, I, to me it seems like your background list um, shouldn't contain genes that aren't expressed in the cell line. Um, unless you think that doing your knockdown is going to upregulate an arbitrary set of genes. So, I mean, that's just my opinion. That's not what everybody does. Uh, people just sometimes, you know, your gene list could be, as you point out, all the genes that either are upregulated, so are above some threshold, or are differentially regulated, so either upregulated or downregulated. There's kind of two different ways to, to do that. Um, but even in this condition, you might even consider using one of these rank list type tests. Some of these rank list tests can, can test for both up and down regulation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, are there any more questions? Okay. Right, and then we talked about uh, already why we might want to consider rank lists, and you brought up one example, and there's other examples you might consider. For example, there maybe there's no natural threshold. There often isn't. Um, and you should worry about this if you get a lot of different results at different threshold settings. right? Because if you can't choose a natural threshold and the results that you get, depending on the threshold that you choose, I mean, that's a little bit disconcerting, a little bit. Um, and then there's also a possible loss of statistical power to do a thresholding. Right? So if you only look at the most highly expressed genes, maybe you're not able to detect signals that you would be able to detect if you reduced your threshold a little bit. Yeah? Are you saying that the enrichment gets around the problem of threshold setting? Yes. Wow, okay. And um, the example is exactly the same thing. Except instead of just taking your uh, gene set, you have a ranked gene list. So you have to have some way of ranking the genes. Uh, some of the tools, like GSCA, will actually figure out that ranking for you. OK. Um, and then otherwise, it, uh, the, the, uh, the workflow is exactly the same. Yeah? Sometimes what we do in sequencing is we rank the list and then take top 1,000. Yeah. And then do enrichment analysis mm -hmm. on those 1,000. So there, we are doing a selection, but based on ranking, right? That's right, yeah. But you would do that, that's, that's, I mean, that's one of the ways you can define a gene set. Sorry, a gene list. You can threshold by saying, you know, we want to find things that are, uh, you know, upregulated at least twofold. Or you can just take, like, the highest 100 or highest 500 and say, okay, that's, uh, that's what I'm going to say is my gene list. Wow, uh, it's hard to say. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm not entirely sure that I know the answer to that question. Um, yeah, the question is, what has more Cisco power? Doing like a, a gene set, like doing a lead gene list, or looking at a rank list? And so my last slide claimed that doing the rank list does that, uh, uh, but I don't know for sure what has more power. What, it, what you might be able to detect is signals that you otherwise wouldn't be able to detect because you choose the threshold wrong. So it might have different power, <laughs> I guess is what I might say. Yeah. Can you just quickly repeat what, what you said was the appropriate background for the cell line? So um, 
it's like I said, it's 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 it is a bit of a philosophical question what the appropriate background is, right? So, and it does depend a little bit upon the question you're asking. But if you are, for example, looking in a cell line, um, and you see, you know, these these genes are expressed in the cell line, you do a knockdown, you see some of the genes are downregulated or upregulated. Um, it doesn't seem to make sense to me to include genes that aren't expressed in the cell line and are never expressed in the cell line and are unlikely to be expressed because, uh, due to any effect that your knockdown has in your background. But it gets a bit complicated, right? Because then you have to ask, the, ask yourself the question, if I do this knockdown, are genes that don't get expressed in the cell line, are they suddenly going to be expressed? Right? And if you think that's true, then your background should be the entire genome. Some, some parts of Right, exactly. So you said, so you take the uh, genome? Is that what you said? So that's what I said, yeah, but as Gary pointed out, some parts of the chromosome could be deleted. So, I mean, these, these questions are, are hard to answer. Um, and definitely, I think it's something you should think about. Um, also, one way to address it is try it both ways. If you don't get any variation in your results, So, so Gary's so Gary's suggestion, which is a good one, is you could try it both ways. Yeah. Uh, so um, no, Gary, do you have suggestions for? Um, it's 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 hard in general to, to do that. I mean, if you somebody might have profiled with the questions about cell lines. There are a lot of cell line expression databases, but uh, I guess I would probably only look at the parts of the genome that are deleted or something. And I don't even know where to get that data. But I think a lot of the cell lines have been sequenced and uh, gene expression has been measured. And under more than a thousand, um, the, uh, um, I just have to remember, do you remember, I know the Broad and the Sanger Institute both have cell line cell line sequencing projects, um, totaling more than a thousand cell lines. I think they're mostly cancer cell lines, but uh, there are some on the I mean, I can tell you what we do. So usually you have some cases and you have some controls, right? Or you have like the untreated conditions and the treated conditions. And so for our background, usually we use genes that are expressed in either of those conditions. Right, and then we look for differential expression. I'm not convinced that that's entirely perfect, but I'm I'm pretty happy with it. Yeah. What do you think of that, Gary? Yeah. yeah. And it's just that you have to use it. You can't use that background for some like, more data that comes in after you've treated or something. Yeah. Okay. Great. I, uh, so here's the outline. We've already talked about everything on this list. Okay, so the test for gene list, the only test you ever need to know, is called Fisher's exact test or the hypergeometric test. Uh, I give it two names because whenever I give it one name, someone always comes up with the second name. Uh, and Fisher's exact test might, uh, might test for both over-enrichment and under-enrichment, but there's a difference of opinion about that. So I don't know. Um, certainly the way that everybody uses Fisher's exact test, test for over-enrichment. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So what we're going to do here is something called hypothesis testing. And I, you probably um, if you have heard about that before in statistics. You have two hypotheses about the data, and you want to compare them to see which is the better explanation. Okay. Um, and let's just call them like the boring hypothesis and the fun one. Right? That's the null is the boring one. Something, nothing interesting is going on, and the fun is something interesting is going on. Right? Okay. I, I, to understand what a p-value means, I think it helps to understand that we know a lot more about the boring hypothesis than we do about the fun hypothesis. Right? The boring hypothesis says the genes aren't changing, right? Or there's there's no fun pattern or interesting pattern to mutations in exomes, and um, if that were the case, 
then we could describe what the data should look like. The problem with the fun hypothesis is no, it's very hard to pin someone down and what the right answer is for the fun hypothesis. They don't give you a very good description, right? So um, in the boring hypothesis in Fisher's exact test, I know what a random draw looks like, right? And I just, the statisticians have studied this for a very long time. I know all the probabilities involved in a random draw. But in terms of being over-enriched, I don't know how much it's supposed to be over-enriched. Maybe it's supposed to be over-enriched a bit. Maybe it's supposed to be over-enriched a lot. So I can't describe the fun hypothesis very well. So the only thing that you can get is saying whether or not the boring hypothesis can explain the data. Right? And um, so what a p-value is, is the chance that you would see the enrichment or something more extreme if it was the boring hypothesis. And the important thing is it's conditional. If boring hypothesis, then I see this data with this probability. Now, what people often think p-values are is a false positive probability. And it's not a false positive probability because in order to know if something's a false positive or not, you need to know how likely it is that the fun hypothesis is true. And in order to know that, you need to know what the data should look like if the fun hypothesis is true, and no one will tell you that. Okay? So I, I came up with this kind of goofy example on my um, bike ride in today. Uh, I'm going to try it and see if it helps, or maybe it won't help. So I have this like fantastic device. It's called the two nose machine. Right? And then uh, you put your head in the fantastic device, and then you get a number that comes out, and that number tells you whether or not you have one nose or two noses. Okay? Now, 5% of the time, if you have one nose, the two nose machine says you have two noses. Right? And the two nose machine goes bing, 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 you have two noses. How likely it is do you think that I have two noses? I mean, you can't look at my face. Like, the likelihood is zero, because nobody has, or a very small number of people have two noses. Right? But on the other hand, if I had the one nose machine, and 5% of the time, if you had two noses, it told you that you had one nose, and bing, 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 the, nose, the one nose machine says you have one nose, we believe it. Right? Even though the false positive, even though like 5% of the time the one, uh, the one nose machine makes what's called a type 1 error. It says you have one nose when you actually have two noses. Okay? So that's what the p-value tells you. The p-value tells you how likely you were able to see this, uh, the probability you were able to see this result or something more extreme if it were the boring hypothesis. And it can't tell you anything about the fun hypothesis. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So, well, I'm just from now on, I'm going to call it a type 1 error. Because if I call it a false positive, people get confused. And you think about, you know, the false positive probability is that. And it's not, because you need to know something about the fun hypothesis. Okay. So, let's call it type 1 error. The probability of a type 1 error. I hate that language, but it's, it's clear. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, if I tell you... In the, uh, in the background population, there are like, let's say, 500 black genes and, and uh, 4,500 red genes. And I say that I took a random sample of five genes from that, uh, from that population, then this, this little histogram here tells you the probability that I would get exactly four balls, the probability I'd get exactly five black balls, the probability I'd get exactly three balls, two balls, zero balls, and one ball. And those probabilities are also called the hypergeometric probability. Someone's computed this, and it has a lot to do with permutations and combinations, and I could write it down for you, but um, I'm not going to. Um, I'm not entirely sure I could write it down without help, but I could probably figure it out about after about five minutes. Okay, so the p-value is just the sum of these two probabilities. So it's four, four black balls or more. So you, you sum these two probabilities together, and that gives you the p-value. And that's the probability that you would have seen four black balls or more if this were a random draw. Okay? And that's, and this is the null distribution. This is a hypergeometric test. And, okay. So, um... Uh, 
So usually all you do is you just put your background list in and you put your foreground list in, you, you click off the pathways that you want to check and it computes these hypergeometric or these Fisher's exact test p-values for you and then does the correction. Some people are unlucky and they their uh, tools don't, oh that's me, yeah just, there I'll put it in the airplane mode. Sorry folks. Okay. Uh, sometimes people have to do this themselves. And if you look up a Fisher's exact test uh, on the internet, you'll find people want a 2x2 two two contingency table. And this is a 2x2 two two contingency table. And so uh, in here, the columns are in the gene list, not in the gene list. And the rows in this are in the gene set or in the pathway, not in the pathway. And once you put the numbers in, it can do the computation to give you the, the p-value for Fisher's exact test. I would look very carefully to see whether or not it's giving you a one-tailed or two-tailed p-value because of what I told you before. So one-tailed only looks for over-enrichment, two-tailed looks for over-enrichment and under-enrichment. But we're almost never in a, in a circumstance where we can, uh, where we can detect depletion. We can only, usually only detect over-enrichment. Okay, so in some important details, um, to test for under-enrichment of black, we can also just test for over-enrichment of red. Those two things are identical. Again, uh, my little lecture, you need to think about the background population. Okay? As Gary said, um, if you're not sure what the background population is, you can try a couple and see whether or not your results change a lot. And if they do, then you have to really think more carefully about the background population. Um, often it's obvious. Um, and so to test for enrichment of more than one pathway, uh, you just apply Fisher's exact test separately for each pathway. Okay, and that's what these tools are going to do. It's going to you can take a pathway for each pathway. It's going to uh, check the overlap, and then it's going to uh, compute a Fisher's exact test p-value separately for each one of these pathways, and then it's going to correct those p-values in some way to correct for the fact that if you test multiple times, you're more likely to get a, a type one error, right? Type 1 error, remember, as I, I used that language before, so that's what I'm going to say. Type 1 error. Okay. That's when it's the boring hypothesis, but the data uh, looks consistent with the um, fun hypothesis. Okay. All right. And so, Fisher's exact test is the only one that you need to consider. So, binomial and chi squared tests, sometimes you see these things. Um, so, for the 2 by 2 table, where there's just like two possibilities in the pathway or not in the pathway and then there's only in the gene list or not in the gene list. Fisher's exact test is called Fisher's exact test because it computes the exact chi-squared probabilities. Otherwise the chi-squared test is an approximation. Right? So, so you don't need to use the chi-squared test. You can use the chi-squared test but it's an approximation. But for the 2 by 2 contingency table you can use Fisher's exact test. And sometimes people also use the binomial test, but it, once again, the Fisher's exact test is exact, and the binomial test is an approximation. Okay, and again, like I said, for rank lists, I've listed here all the tests I know of for the rank lists. Um, maybe there are even more than what, uh, what I've said here, um, but um, each one of these tests tests something different, and there's some slides uh, that I, I, later on where I'm going to try to distinguish between these different tests. But there's like at least five different tests, and two of these are actually identical. They just had uh, people didn't realize that they were coming up with the same test. So Wilcoxon rank sum test and the Man Whitney U test are identical. So some people call it the Wilcoxon Man Whitney test. Okay. So what's the minimum hypergeometric test? So this test, it's, you know, it's a nice idea. Um, uh, basically what you do is you take your rank list of genes, right? You start at the top and like just try Fisher's exact test thresholding at every gene. So you start with one gene in your gene list, compute Fisher's exact test. Two genes in your gene list, compute Fisher's exact test. Three genes in your gene list, compute Fisher's exact test and go all the way down, computing all those p-values and then you find the point at which you get the minimum p-value. Okay, that's, that's why it's called the minimum hypergeometric test. Then you have to go back and make a correction for the fact that you tested a whole bunch of times. Okay. 
So, so this, yeah. Is that where you get rid of the artificial threshold? Exactly. You just choose the best threshold is one way to think about it. When you let the test do it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so um, as far as I can tell, this test was originally described in this paper that I've cited right here. Okay. So, the nice thing about that fit minimum uh, hypergeometric test, it does give you a threshold, which is sometimes helpful. So you can say, okay, this is you know this is the point at which I achieve the minimum p value. That's useful. Okay. So, this is the point at which I try to, yep. It can go up and down. So when does the test go? It tries every single point on the list. Where do you, Where do you get the minimum p-value? Not all. So the um, the p value is a is tells you something about the list. So what the p value tells you is is it's a measure of enrichment in you know the top of the list for the pathway that you're looking for. The threshold just tells you where the test achieved its minimum value. And you could think of that as having some meaning. It has a little bit of meaning. Yeah. So p values can go down or go up, right? So and in fact, I think the next slide will make this a little bit clearer. Okay. So the p-values for the list. The p-values for the list. Yeah. Yeah. So it's one list and one pathway. And either you get a decent quote unquote p-value for the list or you don't. Let's say you get so usually you have one list and you're testing against a bunch of different pathways. So you can say the p-value is connected to the pathway. The list doesn't change when you try different pathways, um, only the pathway changes and the threshold, the, the place that you achieve the minimum p-value might change, but the list doesn't change. The rank of the list doesn't change. So yes, it's for the entire list, but it's, more, it's better to think about the p-value as being for the pathway. Yeah. Okay, and so, so what, uh, what I've done in this figure is uh, taken the, uh, the pathway or the gene set and then all the, the, uh, the gray lines, these are all the genes in the list, and the red lines are those genes that are also members of the pathway. And here are what I've called the ES score, and I'll explain why I did this, um, is the minus log P or the hypergeometric test of that, that, that threshold. So what am I doing here? So you know, p-values are more exciting when they get smaller, um, but people always forget that and they think bigger things should be more exciting. So the way to, th to make bigger things more exciting is to take the one over the p-value, right? So, and then the log is a nice way to not have to deal with really big numbers. Because you get like one over 10 to the minus six, you get a million, you get one over 10 to the minus 15, you get a number that I don't know how to say, a thousand trillion, right? But if you take the log of that, you get six or 15. So this is the negative log to the base 10 of the p-value of the hypergeometric test. And I'm going to call that the ES score. And the reason I'm calling that the ES score is I'm going to connect this test with the GSCA test, which uses something called the ES score. Yeah? So if you use uh, this test on multiple pathways, then yeah. you can get different thresholds for each of the pathways. Yeah. So then how will you compare across the pathways? Well, it depends. It, it depends what you interpret the threshold as meaning. So for me, I just think of the threshold as a way of getting a p-value. It just so happens that to test the entire uh, rank list, you just you try all the thresholds and you just take the minimum p-value. If you think the threshold is telling you something meaningful, then then I guess you have a problem. Yeah. In this figure, it seems like the genes were added to the genes in a linear order from left to right. So in this figure, please repeat your question. If you look at the, 
the, the problem that they don't believe in the ranks. Yeah. In terms of the things like the genes on top of the chart were added to the yes spot uh, from left to right, you know, linear order to that G1 by one. Yeah, so so um, as you as basically uh, um, I'm gonna come over here and then I'll come over there. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna. Uh, <laughs> it's not gonna be able to record me either. Uh, this is too bad. Okay, I'm a little bit off the record now. Okay, so 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 basically the way that this is gonna work, right, is if you start at the top of the list. And as you go down the list, when you, when you encounter a gene that's not in the pathway, the p-value is going to go up, which means our like, inverse p-value is going to go down. Right? So it starts off, goes down, 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 down. Once you hit a gene in the pathway, the p-value goes down, which means our inverse p-value goes up. Right? So, so the jumps occur where the red genes are. And so you go up, 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 up. And then you go down, 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 up, 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 and you get to the end here, and then you start going down, 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 down. Are we looking at the uh, only a linear order, or it could be any combination without any order? For example, say if we combine all the red all the red bars, we select all the red bars, and then we not select all the black bars. Uh, okay. I'm trying to I'm going to go over to this side of the room now so they get equal time. Okay. All right. So we're not selecting anything here. This is just, this is just a way of indicating. Uh, so the black lines here are indicating the genes. And this is the top of the list. And then this is the bottom of the list. And what I'm trying to show here in a not ideal fashion is which genes in the list are in the pathway and which ones aren't. And so the black lines are the ones that uh, are not in the pathway, and the red lines are the ones that are in the pathway. And what I'm trying to indicate with this figure is just you know visually when you look at the ES score, the enrichment score, whenever you see a black line, it goes down because the p-value goes up. And whenever you see a red line, it goes up because the p-value goes down. And so that's why I warned that the alignment here between the bars and the plot is a little bit off. Unfortunately, I've been a professor for too long. I can no longer code. <laughs> so it's, it's got to be like, it's got to be Microsoft PowerPoint for me to make all my figures. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's what happens. That's what I'm trying to show with the, with the black and red bars. Um, and it is a linear order because it's just a rank list. So you always just go from the top of the list to the bottom of the list. You don't have like different paths that you can take down the list. Maybe you're thinking of like, you can think of maybe like a phylogenetic tree and then trying to check this, the, the pathway enrichment along some sort of branching tree. I don't know how you would do that. I, I think split animals that is running. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Any more questions? Okay, so, boom. This is the point at which you achieve the minimum p-value. You know, that's, that's when the enrichment score is the highest. OK. OK, so now here I've done something a little bit fishy. Well, not fishy, tricky, let's say. It's not fishy, it's tricky. And that I put minimum hypergeometric tests and GSCA test. And I've, I've said it's the same thing. And in fact, it kind of is the same thing. I mean, what they're doing is essentially identical. What, how they differ is how much you go up and how much you go down when you go do this ES score plot, right? So, so for the minimum hypergeometric p-value, how much you go down and how much you go up is governed by whatever this p-value calculation is, right? And it you know makes genes go. I mean, it has a certain amount that you're going to go up based on how, how where you are in the list and how many genes have come before. Um, GSCA makes a different decision about what that number should be. Okay. If, if, you, if you went up the same number, if you went down like one unit and went up one unit every time you encountered the gene, that test is called the Komagorma, Komagor, oh my goodness, Komagorov Smirnov test, or the KS test. Okay? The GSCA test is almost identical to the KS test, except they sometimes have this kind of weighting scheme that they think 
going up and going down near the beginning of the list or the end of the list is more important. So they take bigger steps at the beginning or at the end. Whereas the minimum hypergeometric test, the step the relationship between steps and how much you go up with the ES score is kind of obscure. I mean, it's not obscure. You can write down what that is. But it's not going to be as something as straightforward as going up a certain amount or going down a certain amount. It's going to depend where you are on the list and a whole bunch of other things. Okay? But essentially, all the tests are doing the same thing. They're making this ES score plot, and they're looking for the maximum ES score. Well, sorry, minimum hyper geometric p-value is looking for the maximum ES score. GSEA and Komagaro Smirnov is looking for the ES score that's most different from zero. Okay, let me explain that. And no, uh, okay, I'm going to explain it now without a figure. So, oh, I have to go over here. Okay, so let's go back to this thing. Is the ES score? You said it goes up, 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 down, 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 right? It goes down every time there's a black line. It goes up every time there's a red line. Okay, the reason it goes up and then goes down is because there's more red lines at the front. What if I reverse the order, right? So what if all the black lines came first and then the red lines came? So, so there'd be reds at the, at the end of the list rather than the beginning of the list. Can anyone tell me what this like ES score plot would look like? Yeah. Flip it this, this way, I think, and then maybe this way, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm not sure, right? But yeah, it goes down. Right, so it goes down, 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 up, 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 and then this point right here, that's the minimum point, and then for the GSCA, that's what you would use, uh, the ES score that you would use to compute your p-value of GSCA. So GSCA, uh, it, meant it looks for enrichment at the top of the list and at the end of the list. Yeah, okay. All right. So, okay, so... So far, yeah. Go ahead. So the threshold means more than nothing. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so in the GSCA test, they call it the leading edge. That it, it somehow corresponds to like some measure of like how diffuse the pathway is at the begin at the top of the enrichment. And uh, for me, I don't completely understand the arguments. Um, but I think Veronique uh, will talk a little bit more about the uh, leading edge analysis. <laughs> so, so you could think of it. I mean, you could think of it like telling you where the enrichment is highest. Um, the reason that I'm a little bit hesitant uh, with this is is because, at least in the p-value, um, you can often get the situations. Um, so. What do I want to say here? Um, like if you had a gene list, let's say there were 10 things on the gene list and two of them were in a pathway, and that was an enrichment because the pathway is very rare. If you just like made that gene list 100 and 20 of the things in the gene list were enriched, the same proportion of the gene list is enriched, right? But the latter is much more significant. Like the p-value is much lower because it's much more surprising to like take a gene list of size 100 and be able to get 20 than it is to take a gene list of size 10 and be able to get 2. Because it's easier to get rare things to happen if you have a small gene list. So the p-value depends not only on the enrichment, which is like the proportion of genes that are in the pathway, but it also depends on the size of the gene list. Right? And so as you go down, boom, 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 your gene guess list gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, but then your enrichment isn't necessarily the leading edge or the point at which you do the cutoff. That's not necessarily where the enrichment is the highest. It tells you something about your gene set to the universal gene set. Does it tell you anything about which genes come first, which genes come second? It tells you something about the, the gene set mapping on your circle onto the radius. Right, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does it say 
Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's there's multiple peaks here, right? Look at this line. Boom, 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 boom. There's lots of peaks. No, two peaks having like similar p value. Then which threshold will you use? Oh, uh, I think in this case, I'm not sure what they do. Uh, for uh, um, I think it's kind of arbitrary. So I, I think GSCA has a certain peak, uh, peak that they use in that circumstance, probably the first one. Uh, minimum hypergeometric, I don't know. Probably arbitrary. It seems unlikely that that would happen. Because um, there's a lot of real numbers. Uh, so, and the p-value calculation, the relationship between uh, the size of the gene list and the enrichment of the gene list is kind of complicated. So I, I suspect in the minimum hypergeometric p-value, it's going to be rare that you get this kind of two-peak problem. Unless, um, so uh, sometimes, how do I, how do I say this? I, if people have seen a lot of talks with p-values on them. If you have seen a lot of talks with p-values on them, there's a specific p-value that you'll see a lot. I'm going way off topic. It's 2.2 times 10 to the minus 16. Maybe you don't care about numbers as much as I do, but I see this p-value all the time. And what that p-value means is the p-value is below the precision that the computer has to calculate the p-value. Um, when I see that, I just think that, that people have coded up the statistical method badly. Uh, but but I mean, basically, there is a way to, to get like more significant p-values if you're a bit more careful about the way that you code it. But you might see the two peaks in, in the my, hy, minimum hypergeometric p-value uh, under those conditions. But I, I suspect it would be relatively rare to see that for the minimum hypergeometric p-value under different conditions. But the way that GSEA does things, I think you could possibly see the two peaks, and then I don't know how they make the decision in that circumstance. Perhaps that qu is more an answer to your question than you wanted, but I don't think it would be complete. Any more questions? Yeah. yeah. Are the leading edge genes the ones that are driving the original score? So yes and no. Um, I mean, so like you can see here, there's still a lot of genes afterwards, just the density decreases a little bit. And so one way to think about it is, is where the enrichment is the highest. But the, the point I was trying to make with the p-values is the p-values get more significant as the, as the gene list gets longer. So you can get a, um, a smaller p-value with a gene list that's less enriched than with a shorter one, right? So like if I did like, if I have a gene list that's like, like 4 out of 10, I could get, that probably has a smaller, uh, larger p-value than a gene list that's like 20 out of 100, even though the enrichment is smaller. So for the minimum hypergeometric p-value, it's kind of the point at which the density is the highest, but it's going to lag behind a little bit. Like if I were going to choose the highest density, I'd probably choose it there, right? Right there. So it's kind of like that. This, this is why I'm so cautious about the interpretation, and because it also depends upon how the step size is taken. Right? Yeah? The leading edge is the dotted red line at the bottom. The leading edge is the, the, the solid red line at the bottom. Oh, let me show you. Actually, I can do this with the, the pointer, can I? Yeah. This thing right here. Yeah. No, I mean in the green, in the green one. Yeah, so this, this is the threshold. Yeah. And then anything above that, it would be the leading edge. So what, what's the dotted red line then? Uh, this, this dotted red line? Yeah. Uh, that's the maximum enrichment score, or alternatively, the smallest p value. Okay, um, so and then for the minimum hypergeometric p value, um, um, so, so remember I told you to compute a p value, you need to, uh, you need to either do a lot of random, uh, uh, random selections or random tests, or sometimes you can do it analytically to compute the p value. Well, for the GSCA, it's not entirely clear what the analytic solution is. 
So they have to redo it a bunch of times to figure out whether or not a given enrichment score could you assign a p-value to an enrichment score. Right? And so the way that they do that is they randomize the order of the genes in some way. Right? And I think in GSCA they uh, randomize the order of the genes by switching the labels of the cases and controls. And so they try all label switchings where you have the same number of cases and the same number of controls. And then when you do that, and you, you, you do the same thing that you did before, where you, you come up with this like enrichment score, and you find the maximum enrichment score, and then you put it on this, uh, then you can just make this histogram that contains the enrichment score. And you know this is one for, I guess, 2,000 permutations. And you see where the enrichment score you got with the original ranking lives. And you ask, what proportion of, the t uh, of these random shuffles have an enrichment score equal to or higher than the one that I uh, that the one you started with is, and that's how you get the p-value. In this case, it's an empirical p-value. So when they ask you about permutations, that's what they're doing. Okay. Questions about that? Okay, and we've already talked about this. If you go up, you can get uh, enrichment. If you go if the things are at the bottom of the list, you get this thing goes down. Yeah. So yeah. I got the point about the ES score, but when you say about GSEA score, you mean, what did you say about more than zero? I think I heard that the term wrong. Not, I mean, this can be represented. This one? Yes. Yeah, so oh. Is it the, what the GSEA score is? This Exactly as the ES score, or it's based on the diagram, and then convert to another score. Yeah. So, so GSEA will compute the enrichment score by making that plot, okay. and then finding the maximum point. And then it will show the, the, the score based on the minimum p-value, or based on the top to the. So for, for now I'm, I conflated these two tests because I tried, I tried to like do things in parallel. So the minimum hypergeometric p-value, the rich enrichment score actually just corresponds to a p-value. Um, in GSCA, they, they have a different way of computing the enrichment score, uh, where they take a step up every time they encounter a gene that's in the pathway, and they take a step down every time they encounter a gene not in the pathway. And the size of the steps uh, could be constant, or it could depend upon how close you are to the front or the back. So it's just some computation that they do. And as a result of the computation, you get uh, these plots that look like this. And then the enrichment score for a given ordering of the genes is the maximum or the absolute value, so either the maximum or the minimum, Okay, whatever is biggest. All right. So then. So that's so now you have that enrichment score, and you want to translate that enrichment score into a p-value. For the minimum hypergeometric p-value, it's it's easy because it's already there. For this, it's harder because there's not an analytical way to do that. So they have to do it by uh, like uh, permutation-based analysis. And in the permutation-based analysis, you change the labels, you flip the labels of the c cases and control, you randomize them, recompute the enrichment score for that and then just do that a bunch of times and look at the distributions of random uh, of enrichment scores where you have a random distribution of cases and controls and compare that to the one where you we have the one that you started with okay any more questions all right so uh, because Gary finished early we have extra time which means I can finish my slides um, <laughs> And so I wonder, though, if, if uh, you want to take like a one-minute breather, or maybe I should, no, 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 Anne says no. Yeah, we'll never get you back in your seat. Um, so let's talk about quickly about multiple test corrections. And, and like with the p-values, there's one part of this talk that's easy and one part of the talk that's a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Any questions before I start? Okay. Yes. Yeah, go. What, what, what you talked so far about Yeah. But we didn't say anything about individual genes, whether the individual genes are 
up or down or whatever. We just have your gene list, which you could have taken from metabolomics or RNC or whatever. Yeah. So you're not, you're not testing anything about one individual gene? No. No. So that would be different if you want to know what's going up or down in two conditions. So. Oh, maybe yes, maybe no. You can go gene by gene or you can go set. Yeah, I mean, you know, you have a variety of ways. If you have two different conditions, you have a variety of ways of coming up with gene lists. You can say, let's take all the genes that go up under either condition. Let's take all the genes that go up under one condition. Uh, sorry, under both conditions. You have to come up with some way of defining the gene list. Okay, let's. We could talk about this a little bit off because I'm I'm a little bit behind, and so I want to make sure that you get the multiple test correction because this stuff's pretty important. All right, so. You want a small p-value. How do you get a small p-value? Uh, well, one thing you can do is you can just uh, continually take a whole bunch of uh, samples of set uh, size 5 from the background population. right? And if you do this enough, eventually something fun will happen. right? And so, for example, in the case that we had before, you say you want four, uh, at least four black balls. As long as you're willing to take about 10,000 samples, You'll get four black balls, almost certainly, right? And so, what does this mean for us? Well, that's a you know, if what we're looking for is we're trying to prevent, we're trying to assess whether or not the gene list that we took was randomly selected from the background. If we just continually take gene lists from the background by random, and then just stop and report the gene list that we like, sorry, that's not cool, right? Um. So now what you're, what you're not doing is you're not taking a whole bunch of different gene lists out, but you're doing something different when you try a whole bunch of different pathways is, oh, no, this is a little bit behind. So is, is instead of taking different gene lists, you're just relabeling the genes. So instead of looking for black balls and red balls, you're looking for square balls and circular balls, right? So you're kind of doing the same thing. If you're going to take 10,000 pathways and you're going to ask the same question, are any of these gene lists, are any of these pathways enriched in my gene list? It's almost almost like paying this the p uh, p value lottery, but in just slightly a different way. So you can't do that, right? Um, because you're going to get type one errors. You're going to get situations in which there is no enrichment. There, are, you know, in which the enrichment that you see in that pathway could have been due to uh, random chance. Okay. okay so. There's actually a simple way to correct for this. And the simple way to correct for this is called the bond feroni correction. And you've probably seen this before. And so your corrected p-value is just equal to m times the original p-value, which we're going to call the nominal p-value. Right? And so m is the number of tests you do. All right. That's easy. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is you know, you're testing against 0.05%, against uh, you're testing against 5%, so you could either multiply the p-value and then test it against 5%, or take the original p-value and test it against 5% divided by the number of tests that you've done. Those are mathematically equivalent. Okay. And that's what the bond for only correction does. Okay, so, um, if m is really big, let's say m is like 10,000. Uh, sometimes... Well, actually, often you'll get p-values that are bigger than one, right? Which is weird. Um, so don't worry about that. P-values, they're they're like bounds. This means that the probability that what you you know the probability the type one error is less than or equal to the p-value. Okay, so you know if you have a p-value of like a hundred. Well, the probability that you get a type 1 error is less than or equal to that because it can't be greater than 1. Right? So just think of it as a bound. And the reason to think about it as a bound, especially in this case, is this bond for only correction is probably the most stringent thing that you can do. It makes the fewest assumptions about the relationship between the different pathways to one another. And often it's just way too stringent. Right? Now, you can get a little bit more power out of things. There's a different type of 
correction of the same type that you can use, but almost nobody uses it and doesn't give you that much. Okay. Bon Froni is easy, you just multiply it by the number of tests. Okay. Um, so when you use the Bon Froni correction, um, you correct for something called the family wise error rate. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, and this is kind of important. So if you do a thousand tests and then you report all the pathways that are enriched at a Bonferroni or family-wise error rate corrected probability of, of uh, 0.05 or less, you are saying something about the probability that any of your enrichments are type 1 errors, like any of them. So it tells you a probability of like more than one. Right? So if you do like a thousand tests, 500 are enriched, and you say, and you report a family-wise error rate of uh, 5%, that's saying of the 500, the probability that any of these 500, like any one of them in, in the set, is a type 1 error is, is 5% or less. Okay. So that's different than another thing that you can say. The other thing you could say is, you do the uh, you do the uh, you um, you do your tests. You get 500 uh, pathways that are enriched, and you say uh, I want a false discovery rate of five percent. And I'll talk about what that is in a difference in, in a while. That says that on average we expect 25 of these 500 are type one errors. Right? Those are two very different things. Right? One of them saying the probability that any one and the other one saying that 25 of these 500 tests are type 1 errors. Very, very different. Okay, so family-wise error rate, that's the first type of correction. Extremely stringent, really hardcore. And if you can use it, great, because you have like all the guarantees in the world. And like everything that you measure, you can be pretty confident. Like everything you report, you can be pretty confident. Okay. Right, and so uh, almost always, um, you're going to be very disappointed when you do a Bonferroni correction. And for that reason, people like uh, are willing to accept this more, less stringent condition called the false discovery rate that says, you know, I've reported to you uh, 500 of these pathways are enriched, but on average, 25 of them are probably type 1 errors. Okay, so just to repeat, it's the expected proportion of the observed enrichments due to random chance. Now, oh man, I hate this slide. Okay, the accepted proportion of the enrichment set are type 1 errors. Okay. Right. Okay. So that, this false discovery rate, it's a different type of guarantee. And for that reason, they don't call it a p-value, they call it a q-value. Right. <laughs> now, the thing to realize is that what the false discovery rate is saying is as the number of enrichments you report, as the number of tests that, uh, that pass increase, the number of type 1 errors also increases. It's the proportion of the tests that you report. Okay. All right, questions about that? OK, great. So um, the classic way to compute the false discovery rate is something called the Benjamini Hochberg. Uh, and um, don't worry, this takes like two minutes to go through and then we're done. Okay, so how do you compute it? So you, you take the nominal p-values of, of all the pathways that you've tested for and you sort them in, uh, in increasing order of the p-value. So the most significant ones are at the top, boom, 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 boom. And in this cartoon, there's like a nominal p-value of uh, 0.99 right at the bottom. Right. Okay. Then you compute an adjusted p-value. So what is the, the adjusted p-value? Well, the adjusted p-value is equal to the number of tests that you did, the, the original p-value, times the number of tests that you did, which in this case is 53, divided by the rank of that p-value in the list. So this is the highest rank one, so it's one. This is the second highest rank one, is two. It's the third highest rank one, is three. Okay. So now that's the adjusted p-value. Okay, and we're almost there. Then the last step to compute the q-value 
is you look at all of the adjusted p-values and the q-value is equal to the minimum adjusted p-value at that rank or lower. Okay, so, so here in this example I have these adjusted p-values of 0 0.053, 0 0.053, 0 0.053. I've got one that's 0.04, then I go back to 0 0.053, and let's just assume that all the adjusted p-values from here to all the way down are higher than 0 0.053. Okay, so in this case, this 0 0.04, this adjusted p-value, that becomes the q-value for all the higher ranks. All right? And that doesn't propagate down to here. Okay, and then so the nominal p-value threshold for FDR greater uh, less than 0.05 corresponds to the lowest ranked p-value that has that q-value of less than 0.05. Okay. That's it. It's called the von Braun, uh, It's called the Benjamin E. Hochberg step down procedure. It's either step up or step down. So. Um, I write fifty percent of the time. Okay. Even though four and one get the same adjustment. Right. It's still the minimum. Yeah. I'll come over here. It's still this one because this one's smaller. So the list is, the first list is terribly important. The first list is terribly important, yeah. And the ranking is important. You can see up here actually this adjustment, it multiplies by the number of tests divided by the rank. That's just the von Peroni correction. Right? So that's super stringent. Right? But as you go down the list, you become less and less stringent. And the reason is, is because the false discovery rate depends on the number of tests that pass. Right? So you can become less stringent as you go down the list because more and more tests pass and you're making a statement about the proportion of tests that pass. So, so the point of by three of the P value in line one is more significant than the same value on line five because you want to find tests. And the first one was just the first one. Yeah. That's the reason. Well, the, the reasoning is, sorry, I'll try to state, um, it's, it's about a group of tests that pass. When we make that group bigger, um, then there's the, a smaller proportion of that group is a type, uh, are due to type 1 errors. Right, so if I, have, if I have, like, say, 500 tests that all achieve a p-value of 0.05, and then I have 500 other tests that achieve a p-value 0.06. You know, in, in terms of a proportion, the bigger set has more, has a larger proportion that are type one errors. But I don't know what my point is. Um, <laughs> let's just leave it there. I feel like I'm talking myself into a hole. Yeah. So I just want to. Multiple pathways. Right. Yeah. Now, so you don't have to do this yourself in your GSCA. GSA does this for you. Whenever someone reports a false discovery rate, this is this is what they're doing. You you don't have to do this. I'm telling you how it's done. If you're one of the in case you know, for your own edification, because I you know numbers are fun. Um, but the other reason is in case you have to do it yourself. In this case, you're in one of these situations where the tool doesn't cover what you need. Or like, you know, you did do the GSCA and for some reason GSCA doesn't have the pathways you need. Maybe you can upload the pathways in. But but you're you're in a situation where you don't have full coverage of everything you want to do with the tools. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
But if you're using DSCA and someone gives you a Q value or false discovery rate, this is how they got it. This is probably how they got it. There are other ways to compute the false discovery rate that make more assumptions. This is the one that makes the smallest number of assumptions. Yeah? Um, what if some number runs higher after the adjustment to have a lower so this, this right here, um, well you see the adjustment, the adjustment becomes, uh, it, you're multiplying by a smaller and smaller number because you're increasing the denominator. So, so even though the nominal p values are smaller, what you're multiplying by gets smaller and smaller as you go down the list because you're, you're dividing 53 by a bigger and bigger number. Right. We were looking for the first adjust p value that's above 0.05. Less than 0.05. Or yeah. looking for, for the, the last one. Uh, that's a bit, uh, yeah. 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 But then, like, but the reason this is bigger is because 53 divided by 3 yeah. is a bigger number than 53 divided by 4. Yeah. Right. I guess my question is, after the adjustment, did you see there's some fluctuation when they adjusted the q value? Right, so, so this is just the adjusted p-value, there's not yet the q-value. To get the q-value, you, you have to, like each point, you have to look down the list below to find the smallest adjusted p-value. So, so even though the, the adjusted p-value can go up and down, the q-value always stays the same or gets bigger as you go down the list. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. You are saying by dividing, you are saying that the, if the rank is higher, then you have more chance of getting a false, of being a false positive than if your rank is lower. Uh, no, all I'm saying is that... Um, but you are dividing by a bigger number. Right. So <coughs> your, uh, the multiplication factor is going smaller. That means you are more sure that this cannot be a false positive. So, again, remember what you're doing is you're looking at proportion. So you can, you can as, as it goes down further, you can get, let's not call them false positives anymore. Let's call them type 1 errors. Okay, because people always get upset when you call them false positives because it gets confusing. Call them type 1 errors. So as you go down the list, you do get more type 1 errors. That's right. Uh, almost certainly you can get more type 1 errors. But FDR is a proportion of the tests that are type 1 errors. So as if you pick up fewer type 1 errors as you go down the list, then you are you know, in the, the things in the list. So like here, let's say up here, um, you know, then, you're, then the FDR goes down. It has to do with like the rate. with the uh, this, uh, division by the rank. Right. Because 53 by 5 is always smaller than 53 divided by 1. Right. So you are multiplying a smaller p value with a bigger number and a bigger p value with a smaller number. That's right. So then you are saying my for a smaller p value, my type one error rate, which is the factor which I'm multiplying, is more as compared to a bigger p value will be multiplied with a smaller number. So my type one error of getting that p value is smaller, is less as compared to a smaller p value. Let's maybe talk about this this because we're we're over our time. And one way to think about it is it's a bound instead of uh, an exact number. But like let's talk about off. There's one more point I want to make. I'm sorry I went over time. Um, and this I think is uh, I think one of the more important points of, about this is regardless of what you do, the number of tests that you uh, do. Is always going to decrease your yeah, your ability to your power, right? If you're doing tests, if you're testing pathways that are unlikely to be enriched in your gene list, you're you know that's going to still end up uh, affecting your ability to detect the pathways that are enriched. So be very careful 
about which pathways you look at, right? And so there's various ways to do that. You can you can use Go Slim. Um, you can restrict testing to only the appropriate Go annotations. Um, or one other way that people tend to do it is they they filter the pathways by their size. Okay, so let me be. be, be you have to do this extremely carefully. Um, so like. Um, in terms of getting a, a, a small p-value, pathways with like one or two or three genes in them, just because of the way that the hypergeometric test works or the way that the rank list tests work, they will never give you a small p-value, right? So, so a common thing that people do is they restrict, they say that the, the pathway that they look at has to have a certain size. Some people use 10, I use 30, that type of thing. And that, that removes a lot of the pathways. Because there's more pathways, especially in gene as you go down further the list. Okay, so now what I'm saying is, look at, you look at the pathway size before you do the testing. So you look at the size of the pathway, like the number of genes in your background in the pathway. You can't look at the number of genes in your gene set in the pathway to restrict them, because that's kind of implicitly doing the test. Right? So if you take your gene set and you look at all the pathways, you're like, oh, this pathway, this pathway, and this pathway have zero in my, genes, uh, in my gene list. What you're implicitly doing is computing the p-value. Right? But you can say, okay, well, here's my background. I don't know what my gene list is yet, but like these pathways, only three genes are in the background, so I'm just not going to ever consider those because I'm not going to be able to, I don't have the power to detect enrichment for those pathways. So... So you can re remove uh, you remove the stringency by just removing these these not doing tests for things you're never going to be able to detect enrichment for. Okay, so that was the last point I wanted to make. There's a summary. Um, I'm over time, uh, but I'm I'm happy to stay up here uh, to answer questions.